Please consider becoming a patron of Myth Vision Podcast. You'll get early access to every video, including this amazing one. And you can ask me personal questions, private message me, anything you'd like. Professor James Tabor, I don't know how to phrase this question because there's so much that could be said in this question, but that's not the best video content. The best video content is when I say, <clears throat> Jesus, it seems, anticipated a soon kingdom return coming, whatever that meant. Maybe you could tell us what that meant. Mm -hmm. Paul seems to think, <clears throat> we who remain and are alive, it is coming, whatever that means, rapture, whatever, a transformation, something had to happen and it was supposed to break way into reality, into this world, and transform everything. I have, and I say this as a caveat, then I'll shut up. It's really good that I say this, though. I was a full preterist because I, was, I saw that Jesus said this was going to happen soon. Paul said it was going to happen soon. The book of Revelation says, write these things down, which must soon take place. Yeah. And at the end, he says, these things, I'm coming quickly, blah, blah, blah. That's it's right. about to happen. Mm -hmm. It had to happen because Jesus is God in the flesh. So I couldn't. Get my head around right. that being a lie. Did it fail? And if so, how did it fail? Yeah. Well, I come at it, of course, as a historian. And the first thing I would say, I teach a course called Into the World as We Know It, picking up on REM, and also Leonard Cohen's song. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and the first thing I tell my students first day is we are beginning the study of an idea in the West, apocalypticism, I'm going to call it, messianic, apocalyptic eschatology would be the full description of it. And so far, it has a 100% failure rate. And one of the things I want you to know is that that's what we're studying. We're studying when prophecy fails. This is a course in when prophecy fails. We're going to include Jesus in early Christianity. We're going to start 100 years before that because we have this wonderful library of texts called the Dead Sea Scrolls that record in detail the expectations, disappointment, and failure of an apocalyptic messianic eschatological group before Jesus. Some call them the Essenes. I prefer them just to call them the Dead Sea Scroll group because Essene can mean something else in Josephus and other classical sources. So I start with that in the course. I won't go into all that there, but if you want to read the main thing, it's the Habakkuk Pesher. Now Habakkuk is a book most people have never read. It's in the Bible. It's in all Christian Bibles, whether they're Catholic or Protestant. It's in the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Bible. A prophet, it's not very long. It's just a few chapters, three chapters. And in the book of Habakkuk, the end is talked about. And it says at one point, if it tarries, wait for it, it will surely come. That verse becomes the hallmark. And then it goes on to say, and the righteous one who's going to wait for it shall live by faith. Now, did you get that? That is Paul's main verse. The just shall live by faith. It's in Romans and it's in Galatians. But he translates it as, he who through faith is righteous shall live. You see what he did? This is the most interesting move in the New Testament. If I'm talking about the apocalypse and I say, don't give up. If it tarries, wait for it. The vision is for an appointed time. I'm quoting the whole thing. The vision is for an appointed time. If it tarries, wait for it, it will surely come. The just will live by faith. Very clear meaning. I'm a just person. I believe in God. I don't care if it took longer than I thought or even than God said. I'm going to live by faith, meaning I'm going to believe still that it's coming. I'm not going to give up faith, okay? That's clear. Paul says, no, he who through faith is righteous shall live, meaning... How do you get righteous? By works or faith? He pulls it out of context. It's not even apocalyptic anymore. It's telling you Romans 3, 
all are sinned. You got to have the blood of Christ. You got to have the grace. You got to have forgiveness. And that's how you get righteous. But if we go back to, that's another subject. We can talk about that. But if we go back to the original apocalypticism, Habakkuk is very important. So what does the Qumran group do with that? It's a brilliant thing that they do. And how long you can make it last, I don't know. But they, they don't become preterists. They don't go, oh, well, actually, it actually took place, but it was uh, in a way we didn't expect, which is the standard preterist move. Like, you thought it was literal, but it's literal, but not like that literal the way you were thinking. They don't do that. They say, all the time has been prolonged. Now, as they say, we were right. They're talking about Daniel's prophecy of 490 years, 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel 9. They said, we were right, but now we passed that. And it took them a while. They said, the teacher has died, and in 40 years, all the men of wickedness will be destroyed. They probably went, we think the back at Pesher is maybe even the first century. So they've gone decades, decades, and now people are going, I don't believe the teacher came back. I bet they had preterists then that said, well, he came back. He's in our hearts right now. Or maybe they even had dates. You know, Joe was uh, Russell who started, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses aren't Russell, but Russell said Christ is going to come in 1897, and then he went to 1914. And now they would say the Witnesses developed out of that. Well, he did come in 1914, but he came spiritually, secretly. So that's one move. They don't make that move in the text. What they say is all the times have been prolonged for the mysteries of God are inexhaustible, meaning it's up to God. We thought we had the timetable right. It's still right. God doesn't fail. If it tarries, wait for it. You, it's tearing for you. It's not tearing for God. Or maybe God decided to extend the time and didn't tell you. So you still got a way of pushing it. That's what happens. But in the New Testament, until 70 AD or beyond, I would say even all the way up to Bar Kokhba, people are still holding out hope. And you quoted some of the main obvious things of, you know, the time is at hand, the axe is at the root of the tree. The night is far spent. The yeah, the day is at hand, on and on and on. But the main one is Paul telling people, don't even get married. Mm -hmm. People go, oh, well, celibacy, that's good. It's more spiritual. No, he said, in view of the present distress, uh, the time has come. Those who have wives will be as those who have none form of this world is passing away. He gives all of these warnings about even social things that are happening. And then he says, we who are alive and remain at the coming and so forth. Well, obviously, Paul didn't live to 70. So I guess he was wrong. He thought he would. I think that's what most Preterous interpreters would say. But he certainly thought he was going to live. And uh, so what he's expecting, though, is, is the problem for saying it, well, maybe he was just wrong and it still happened symbolically in some other way. Wait a minute. We did a segment. What does he say is going to happen at the parousia? The Perfect. dead in Christ will rise to meet the Lord in the air. This doesn't sound very symbolic. The living will also rise. They will be transformed into these glorious spirit beings. They will judge angels. They'll sit at the right hand of God. Now, if you're into, quote, spiritualizing or allegorizing, you can apply anything to the most literal statement. I'll meet you tomorrow at three. Well, he didn't really mean meet me at three. He meant I'll meet you in spirit. I'll be thinking of you. But in normal you know, language, we have to understand. And you can read Paul. He's talking about the dead. You and he says what? they're going, you know. You said something important there. You said, mm -hmm. um, this is, it sounds very actual, literal. You weren't referring to necessarily the dead. Let me, let me pause for a second and say this. Because we talked about spiritual resurrection. Yeah. Um, you are speaking literal because even the spiritual resurrected in some way are experienced or seen and understood in some way. And if you're alive, which this is the interesting thing about this to me is the Achilles mm -hmm. Hill. Mm -hmm. They're alive. They're going to be transformed. He thinks at some point everyone's going to go on about their day 
like a thief in the night, mm -hmm. and boom, transformation's gonna take place. And those who are righteous are gonna be transformed. Um, and the, look what follows. Remember the three stages? Christ was raised. Well, look, Christ was raised. That means literally he was transformed in this being and now is at the right hand of God. That's not symbolic. He, that happened. There, those who are our Christ at his coming, this is a real event. And then the conquering of all principalities, powers, and so forth. Then they're going to sit on thrones of judge angels and there's going to be this new creation. And he said, did you know in Romans 8, he, he talks about the new creation. He says the creation itself, this is the clincher, will be delivered at that moment. He doesn't use the term at that moment, but he says when the sons of God are revealed. When they're revealed in glory, the glorified sons of God. The creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay. Meaning, death itself will be abolished. Biological death. And there's a new creation now, a new heavens and a new earth. God dwells, you can put in the book of Revelation if right. you want here. And that's uh, also Isaiah. That's a transformed existence that Paul believes in. No more night. Yeah, that didn't come. That right. didn't happen. So what, as Norman Perrin used to say, what they, you know, it's funny, Perrin with the preterists, he never heard of them, but he said, uh, he always said in class, Norman Perrin at Chicago, what they, and I can't do his British accent, he was from Manchester, but it was, <laughs> he was this sort of big guy with the most, you know, what they most expected to happen never happened. The parousia of Jesus, what they least expected did happen, the utter destruction of Jerusalem and the scattering of God's people. So he actually took it the way, and he's thinking of James and the early followers and so forth. Now, I don't actually agree with the part of that, and I'll tell you why. I think the followers of Jesus did anticipate the destruction of Jerusalem based on Daniel 9, possibly. And as I open the possibility that Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21, the so-called synoptic apocalypse, might reflect something Jesus and his followers were expecting. Because like the Qumran group, they felt that that was a den of thieves. And like Jeremiah declared, this temple's coming down and God will raise up a new house that'll be a house of prayer for all people. Mm how literally you need to bring down the Herodian stones. You know, later, of course, Mark, Matthew, Luke make it very literal, especially Luke. It says the armies will come, they'll surround it, they'll dismantle the whole city, and that did happen. But if you read Daniel 9 at the end of the 70 weeks, which is a 490-year period, it says the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. I mean, how plain could you get? If you're an apocalyptic person and you think you're at the end and there's going to be a final evil ruler, an Antiochus-like figure, and it's also in uh, Daniel 11. He comes into the glorious land, pitches his tents and so Is forth. Is it Nero that in Revelation? But Caligula could have played a role. Caligula, in Caligula. Nero. It's almost like Caligula sent tremors through the whole Jewish Christian world mm -hmm. thinking, oh my God, this could actually happen. He sits in the temple of God claiming to be God and so forth. Uh, but Daniel 9 says he, this guy, the prince who is to come, is going to destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, Jesus could read that. He says the time is at hand. When you say the time is at hand, Paul says the appointed time has grown very short. You never use the phrase appointed time of the end unless you're talking about Daniel. Daniel uses it, I think, six times. And at the appointed time of the end, the appointed time of the end, over and over. So Paul says the appointed time has grown very short, short 1 Corinthians 7. So the appointed time is the clock ticking. And what's going to happen? It'll destroy the city and this hills. So I think it's possible that Jesus followers anticipated that, but they thought it would be replaced with the kingdom of God set up with all the followers on earth as it is in heaven. And I think Paul thought, I'm not talking about James, I think they were more 
literal, you know, like it'll be a, a political, social kingdom. Mm -hmm. I agree with Paul Richardson and others on that. But uh, Paul probably thought that it's much more cosmic. Like, I imagine he thought the Paris, once the parousia takes place, I don't know if the earth just kind of melts away or disappears or it sounds kind of like Second Peter where at the coming, the earth will melt with fervent heat. He says, but we look for the new heavens and new earth. So that sounds more like they're developing Paul's idea because what he says about stage three, what's, what he calls the telos, the telos, the, the fullness, is he has to destroy all rule, authority, and power. That's kind of like a angel thing. You know, the levels of angels and what call, what's called the stoicheia, uh, the forces of evil, they have to all be conquered. And then death itself has to be conquered. And he puts down every enemy, and then the last enemy is death, and then God is all things to all. Panta in pasen, which is just like, the whole universe will be just God permeated, you know. Uh, well, clearly that hasn't happened. <laughs> right. The ultimate. So, I mean, as I read it as a historian, yeah, prophecy failed. It's not, well, let's put it this way. The famous book, When Prophecy Fails. Uh, you talking about Robert Carroll, the old school? No, one? it's that, it's that 50s, it's that book about the cult in the 50s it's called when prophecy fails okay. but it was studying an apocalyptic group it became kind of famous as a as a refrain but you could say well prophecy didn't fail our expectations and interpretations turned out not to be correct so that's always the out but certainly uh, there are no caveats given anywhere in these texts that we're talking about i mean they expect to live to see it and uh, I guess you could say it came in a way they didn't expect, and that would be one avenue you could go. But when you begin to list all the things they expect, it's really hard to say those are now Fulfilled. behind us. Uh, I don't think death has been destroyed. Satan certainly, you say, well, he's sort of bound. Uh, yeah, like in the Holocaust. <laughs> I mean, what yeah. are you talking about? It's a very odd view of history. I just, I mean, again, I'm not trying to harmonize or interpret. I'm trying to just read these texts as historical texts. And they're no different to me than what happened in the fourth century, what happened in the Middle Ages. I specialize in apocalyptic groups, not just ancient. Mm -hmm. My field is probably apocalypticism in the West from Qumran to Waco. That would be, and I don't need to stop at Waco because people have kept going in the last 25 years with plenty more. I definitely want to record with you about Waco at some point. Too, yeah, because now we got the Muslims are going to be the Antichrist. Forget Europe. It used to be how Lindsay Europe yeah. and the Muslims. And I know that preterists can just say, oh, well, that's all futile and there's none of that's right. And I would agree. It's all futile. None of that's right. But the reason it isn't right is you're taking Daniel 11 and you're trying to historicize it into something that it never referred to. I mean, to these people, the end of the age is as real as Antiochus Epiphanes entering the temple, defiling it, and uh, everything that follows, and, and then the resurrection follows in chapter 12 of Daniel, right? It, so whenever 11's over, you know, and it isn't over because it never happened. The ending of 11 has never happened. Right. Then there's the resurrection. Now, is it still going to happen? After? Isn't that what happens in the Synoptic Gospels? I hate to cut yeah, you off. Go I, ahead. Because no, this, is, this is the heart of the issue with the preterist. And most people on the Internet, I don't think they realize this is the last. The, if there's a Jenga tower, there's one block left. You can pull out, in my my opinion, eschatologically, the most sophisticated position within Christendom that tries to still remain Christian is this preterist movement. They're trying to be faithful to the words of Paul and and mm -hmm. and Jesus's time statements. They're trying to say they knew it was going to happen soon. The problem, and is, they were right. They right. think they're right, and yeah. preterists are right. And I want to give them the credit for that because I was there. I was that, mm -hmm. but. 
in order to be right all the way, you have to make words mean things they may not mean. Yeah. Death doesn't mean death, and tears doesn't mean tears, and yeah. and you know whatever it might be. Seas don't mean seas anymore in Book of yeah. Revelation. Or yeah. if you're looking in other areas, the resurrection of the dead, the transformation, all this stuff doesn't mean what it means. So the great white throne judgment, as it's called in Revelation 20, has already happened. Already happened. Everything. Yeah. Everything. There's not a single all thing. the dead, small and great, yeah. small and great that mattered. Because okay. here's the thing that, 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 that a lot of them will take the context and focus it in on Israelites yeah. or try yeah. to make it work into yeah, a I Jewish... just, uh, I know about some of that. Actually, I was, re have you heard of Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone, mm -mm. The American Restoration Movement? Mm -mm. That's a preterist movement. Uh, Churches of Christ, yes. Christian church. Campbell, they call it Campbellites in oh, the yes. 1800s. So in the 1830s, Campbell started that, wanted to restore New Testament Christianity. And he did argue the classic Preterist position, not the, the more modified one, that the millennium is the church and the church is the kingdom. And Augustine even argued this. Mm -hmm. And he debated premillennialists and other prophecy types of his day, like the Millerites, and just toasted them and roasted them. And he also claimed just about everything happened in 70. But like N.T. Wright, as I understand, and other theologians, that tended to lean that way a little bit, you know, like a lot happened in 70 and you had this new covenant and so forth. They still held out for the final events. You know, like it's really hard to read 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15 and Romans 8 and all that. and say, like, yeah, we're in that right now. Or that already happened. Like, yeah, like creation is not decaying anymore. And he's talking about the creation itself. Genesis 1. Yeah, there's no decay. And that's kind Those of leaves falling aren't really decaying. Right. They're spiritually still, you know, and I don't want to make fun of people's ideas, but to me, it's pretty simple. And I'm not going to try to save Jesus or anybody else. Of course, they believe that uh, because they're reading the book of Daniel. You can't stretch Daniel out for millennia if you just open it up and read it. You can't stretch Daniel to 70. Unless you start it's really, Daniel at some way yeah, later point. Yeah, yeah you can't even start. So to me, it, it just, uh, I think Schweitzer was, I dedicate my book, The Jesus Dynasty. I didn't know this until uh, I'd written the book and I thought, oh, my book's going to come out in 2006. And you don't always know. I was with a major publisher, Simon and & Schuster. And you don't always know the date because, you know, it's like, well, it could be fall or spring. Like 2006, I go, whoa. Wait, 1906, uh, Schweitzer published what we call the quest for the historical Jesus. In German, it was called von Reimarus, who's the first quester, uh, to Rheda, where he stops. And so what Schweitzer's, so I put in, I dedicated to Albert Schweitzer 100 years after. So here I am writing the Jesus dynasty 100 years after, mm. and I, I could not stand in his shadow. Albert Schweitzer, in my opinion, is the greatest New Testament scholar who ever lived. He writes on Jesus and Paul. His book on Paul is the best book on Paul ever written. And notice, I wrote a book on Paul. It's called The Mysticism of Paul the Apostle. Unbelievable. Didn't even know about the Dead Sea Scrolls and all this stuff we know now. Boy, if he had known. So what does he do? It's absolutely brilliant. He says... The, and Dom Crossan does this too, John Dominic Crossan and others. These are interim ethics. They're interim ethics. And yes, they're radical as hell, and they will get you killed. So Daniel Berrigan's going to pour blood on a missile cone to stop the Vietnam War and get arrested and thrown in jail for God knows how many years. You know, the priest. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you're going to do acts of, you know, of resistance, and you will get, you'll go to the cross for it. These are interim ethics. It doesn't mean the end of the cosmos is coming. It means that you throw yourself, as Schweitzer put it, on the wheel of history to try to move it forward in God's way. Bring the kingdom. What is the kingdom? The will of God being done on earth as it is in heaven. So you throw yourself, and this is the last page of Schweitzer. Got it. Almost makes me cry to think of it. He said, Jesus threw himself on the wheel of history and it lunged back and crushed him. And he basically says, 
are you willing to take up those interim ethics? He's a pacifist. And, you know, you can argue, yeah, but if somebody broke in my house and they're going to kill, you know, look, I'm sure he could address that. But the point is, I say to you, love your enemies, turn the other cheek. Say, so you can't run a world like that. He says, no, but you can destroy a world like that as you can begin to change. So he called them interim ethics, meaning in the time between wickedness and righteousness, we're called upon to live the radical life for the kingdom. Lots of liber, you know, more liberal preachers, I guess you call them, or more, you know, in some of the mainstream churches, they would say that following Jesus means finding your cross. Is it wearing yourself out for the poor? Is it speaking out for racial injustice? Is it mm -hmm. getting yourself clobbered for this or that? You know, that's following Jesus. And so um, there's a way to... Like, you don't just say, oh, well, it didn't happen, so forget and, everything. Right. Because Jesus had a program of dismantling Rome. Dom's, this Dom is John Dominic Crossan. He has this wonderful book about, I forget the title, we, we could look it up, but it, it's one of his latest books. And it's basically about how the message of Jesus destroyed the Roman Empire and would destroy the evil empires today if we followed it. I mean, it's really powerful. It's so. interesting that you say that. I mean, there's more to it than just apocalypticism, even though yeah. there's a major point that needs to be brought up about that. Yeah. So there's so much more we could be said about the kingdom and, and just different things that seem predictive that may not have ha come to pass. Mm -hmm. And maybe future episodes we could do that. But I've been getting it across the board. Scholarship seems to be, mm -hmm. and the historians all are saying the How same much, thing. How much do you have a minute or two on this? Segment? I've got three minutes. Okay, let me say this. Here are the strategies for cope. This, I developed this in my course. Uh, the strategies for coping with the failure of prophecy, meaning the failure of your interpretation or expectations. One is to reset your date. Just like William Miller did it. Oh, well, 1883, it's 1884. Usually it's more radical than that. You go like, oh, we made a wrong calculation on the creation date or something. Some t now, you can do that a little bit. It's real hard to do much more than like 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. So that's not a really good one. Uh, the second one is to, this order doesn't matter, just say, forget that, I was crazy, I was wrong. I'm not even going to think about that anymore. I've heard people say, don't read the book of Revelation, it'll make you crazy. Like all that stuff, beasts and horns, and none of that ever happened. So you just kind of like put it on the back burner. I'm not going to think about it. So it'd be like marginalize it. Just, just I don't want to hear about Daniel and Revelation. There's all this good other stuff. And a third reason, third strategy, is you spiritualize it. And you start claiming that it did happen and it didn't fail. So those are the three strategies. And the fourth is the one I take. You just recognize that every apocalyptic movement in the West throughout, starting with Qumran is our earliest that we know of, a real apocalyptic movement. They've all failed. And it's not a good track record to put your bets on that the world is going to end in some cataclysmic way with something coming out of the sky and all this stuff. Most likely it'll end the way science tells us. Look at the sun, look at the solar system. And for all of us, it'll end when we die. Thank you.